Um, we're, I'm going to talk about our experience uh, upgrading um, our data collection uh, system to SSDs from spinning rust is what they call it. So if you want to be cool, you call that stuff spinning rust and uh, SSDs are the new thing. Um, I run all the product development at New Relic. Uh, we're an application performance monitor. We collect a lot of data from applications. Um, that data gets posted to us as a web service. Uh, and I'll explain more in detail how that works um, here in a minute. Um, basically, we're heavy on insert, light on read is the best way I would describe it. We're kind of like a flight data recorder. You know, we like to track everything that's happening in a web app, but typically uh, our customers aren't logged in all the time watching that data. But let's say, you know, you get up in the morning and you find out there was a problem at 2 a.m. or if you get woken up, um, you need to have that data available, so you need to scroll back and look at it. Um, I would say at any one time we have maybe five, six hundred um, users accessing uh, data on the site, but we have 450,000 application instances posting data to us. Um, and so the high uh, insert uh, load, but also, you know, read is important, um, are key considerations for us as we transition over to SSD. Um, and we do about 225,000 um, inserts of what we call time slice data. That's basically a row that's got about 10 fields on it. Uh, we do uh, 225,000 um, per second. And that in and of itself is not, is not all that interesting, except that that data also has to be queryable in the event that the user um, is looking at their data. So that's kind of the, the challenge that we have. Um, I, Talked about our architecture briefly. This is only um, important in the sense that we have a web service and all the data gets posted in uh, and um, we have to store all that data and serve it back out. We have a sharded architecture. Um, the way we shard is relatively straightforward. We have a, a master accounts database um, and when a request comes in, either for posting data or for reading data, um, we just look it up in the Accounts Master. And the Accounts Master has a record, an ID uh, for the shard where that data lives. Um, and so we can kind of scale out horizontally uh, based on account sharding um, pretty simply. Right now we have 10 shards and we've been able to keep that number um, at 10 for over a year. And that was kind of important to us um, not to just scale out horizontally. We also wanted to scale vertically within each of our shards. As we learned more about our data access patterns, as load increased, you know, we've tweaked, we've tuned, um, we added memory, and of course we made a major upgrade uh, to SSDs. Um, and the reason I like to keep it at about 10, uh, we have 1 to 10, so there's 11. Technically 10 is a sort of a standby shard, um, is that once you get more than 10 things, anything you do on a database kind of has to be scripted. And with 10, you can still get in and do operations on the command line if you need to. So it kind of transi transitions from a smallish infrastructure that you, know, you can kind of manage to one that absolutely you know, kind of has to be scripted in order to uh, manage it. Our data collection tier is written in Java, by the way. Um, so as the data posts come in, we store it in a Java process. And the Java process has multiple database connections out. Um, and inserts the data in that form. We found Java to be just the, uh, it's you know, stable, reliable, and actually somewhat performant uh, um, in terms of uh, CPU and memory. Um, sort of talk a bit about the hardware architecture of our shards. Uh, so we start out with a fairly I would call it kind of commodity server. Uh, it's a Dell R610. That's a 2U um, unit. Um, it's got a couple of disks in it just for the operating system, but basically it's nothing super fancy, but it's got um, 12 cores, uh, 24 hyper-threaded processors. Um, it's running 96 gigabyte of memory, which is still relatively cost effective. Um, so it's not super, super high end, but it's pretty beefy. Um, and then we made the decision early on uh, to use uh, attached storage, so but direct attached. So we use Dell's PERC 800 card. Uh, we do six gigabit SAS uh, directly attached to um, two external cages. Our 
original cages were the MD-1200 cage, um, and that's a 12-slot, uh, three-and-a-half-inch disc unit. Um, that's where our spinning rust uh, currently lives. That's what we started out with. Um, but the power, of course, of these um, direct-attached boxes is you can plug more of them in. In fact, you can plug them in hot. So as we looked at going to SSD, uh, we knew we would just get another cage, put the SSDs in it, and sort of add it uh, to the server. Um, and so that's what we've done. We use a MD-1220, uh, which is a 24-slot um, uh, for two and a half inch disks. Um, and right now we've got those uh, half full. We didn't fully rack them out with SSDs. Uh, we decided to take and use half of the available slots. And that way, if we decide to add more SSDs later, we can. Or if we decide to add, um, say, larger, less expensive hard drives, for kind of secondary storage where SSD is the primary, we've got some flexibility there. And one of the things that we've learned about ourselves is having flexibility is nice, and um, having room open to make changes uh, is, is also good. So not only that, when we put these things in our um, in our data center, you know, we leave space between the servers. So if we need to put other stuff in between, we're not totally kind of boxed out. Uh, that's kind of traditional systems admin stuff. Uh, and then the processes that we run, we run uh, directly on these shards, the Java um, web service collection tier. And this is a little bit controversial. A lot of times you'll have a separate uh, tier to run your data collection engine, and then a separate tier or separate box to run your uh, MySQL server. Um, but the, basically the data collection engine is really just a channel directly to the database is the best way to think about it. And so for performance reasons and kind of for simplicity, um, we run the Java process and the MySQL processes together uh, on the same box. Um, and we haven't had any problems with that. We've been doing this for over uh, four years now. Um, Java is pretty stable. It's pretty reliable. It's pretty well boxed memory-wise. It doesn't leak anymore, at least outside of the JVM. It won't leak and take down your um, SQL process. We run. Um, four MySQL instances on these shards. Uh, we've got um, sort of two classes of, of uh, MySQL instances. One for metadata, which is kind of the tracking information about these metrics that we store. And then the other instance is the raw data. And what we found is that the raw data, had, the throughput was so high and constant that it was sort of like flushing out and disturbing the metadata, which would have to get kind of paged in um, as we would store stuff. Um, so what we decided to do was break those up into two MySQL instances, uh, and then that way we could configure each um, custom tailored for their, uh, their purpose. We have a, a master and a replica, and then we have two MySQL instances, one for the SSDs that we've added, and the other for the uh, R drives that we added. Um, so Intel is one of our customers, and they introduced us to their SSD team uh, because they had heard that we were investigating SSDs, um, and they came up with kind of a funny quote for us when they heard what happened or what was happening to us. They said we were experiencing a, CP, a serious CPU underutilization problem, um, and I guess when you build microprocessors for a living, that's kind of how you view the world. It's, whether things are doing okay in the CPU, but um, really what we were finding is that we were getting I.O. bound um, at higher load especially. And uh, so Intel um, has a solution for severe, severe CPU underutilization, and that's their SSD group. Uh, and so we'd already been thinking about SSDs, but they hooked us up um, with some of the product managers and the tech support guys, and uh, we kind of formed a bit of a relationship with Intel um, and that was instrumental to us ending up just deciding to go with Intel product uh, versus um, some of the various other options. And I will I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, this is a graph of our, of our own website. And it's a graph um, over seven days. And you can see how much time is spent uh, typically on our website in the database versus in other functions. And it seems to oscillate somewhere between maybe 25% and 30%. Um, and what this tells us is right off the bat, even if we made the database five times faster, you know, we're only going to have some marginal effect 
on our overall app performance. Our marginal may be, you know, 15 to 20 to 30 percent at best, right? Um, and so, you know, is it worthwhile to make this upgrade to SSDs? The thing to consider, though, is that these are aggregate numbers that we're looking at, and aggregate numbers um, tend to wash out the outliers. And what we knew from experience was some of our larger customers that have larger data sets were complaining of slow page performance. And when we drilled into it, we realized, well, they were database heavy. And so we knew that the uh, SSDs, at the very least, would make an impact there. So here's an example of an outlier, I call it. Um, and when you're tuning systems, you know, you can have a couple of strategies. One is to tune for the aggregate, and that's fine. Um, and the other is to tune for the outlier. And so we knew at the very least the SSDs would help us uh, tune in for those outlier experiences. Um, this is a kind of hard to read it, but all that red zone there, that's a single um, database table. And it's called uh, 252 times. There's a lot of queries, but basically we're um, stuck reading data uh, from the database, putting it on a web page. And this is a big customer that just has a lot of data. So that's why um, there's so much time being spent there. This is a slightly different view of our system before the upgrade. Um, it's a, it's a, a disk utilization view. And the simplest way to read this is the blue area on the graph um, is how uh, utilized the disk is in terms of um, write activity. And utilization here is it's not the best metric to track um, how you're doing, but basically if the disk is busy, um, what percentage of the time is it busy, let's say over the course of a minute, and in this case, um, we were, you know, 12, 15 percent busy uh, on average over the course of a minute writing data. Um, and we, um, as again, we have a large RAID set, uh, 12 disks. Um, so, you know, just because we're busy doesn't mean all the disks are busy by any means. But it does give you a sense of what's going on. But more importantly, you can see the read, uh, the read busyness is pretty substantial. Uh, and then sure enough, around midnight, uh, we have a spike in read busyness there. Um, on this Seven. Well, that's actually that's the weekend activity, uh, and um, when we run our background jobs and we do our cleanup tasks, all that data has to be read back in off the disks. Um, and if there's anything that SSDs are going to improve, it's read performance, especially if that read uh, is uh, going to force a seek. There's no seek on SSDs, and they're very fast in that respect. Um, so you know, we looked at all of our data. And we knew SSDs would help. And in general, I would say you're, it's a pretty safe bet that SSDs um, will help, but how much? Um, and so going into this, you know, we knew we had to measure it. Um, and our expectations were maybe on aggregate, it would help a little bit. And on the outliers, it would help quite a bit. Um, so next, you know, how do you evaluate uh, SSD drives? This is a, it's a very good question. Um, there's a lot of drives out on the market now. Uh, I don't know how many vendors, it's probably at least 50 uh, or more vendors have SSD drives. Um, we were not experts in SSD drives. I mean, we were, you know, web app guys, we love performance monitoring. So what are, what are we going to do? Um, and what we decided to do is start uh, with a very reasonable drive, the Intel 320. That's kind of a high-end consumer drive. It's also been used uh, for production operations. Um, it's it got a lot of uh, miles on it. Um, and so we figured that was a, a safe place to start our testing. Um, the next thing is find a representative benchmark for your particular case. For SSDs, this is very, very important. I wouldn't recommend just using a generic benchmark tool. I mean, they'll all show various things based on the strengths and weaknesses of SSD versus hard drives. Um, we were lucky in this sense. So we have our data collection tier in Java. And we were able to build a simulated Java app that just pumped data in flat out, um, but using some of the same code of our data collection tier. So we, we built, it took us just a couple of days, uh, we built a very representative benchmark for our app, and then we ran it and ran it and ran it on the hard drive uh, array, um, recorded the numbers, and then when we got the SSDs installed, um, again we ran it and ran it and ran it with different configurations and settings, and you know mentally tried to validate what we were seeing 
um, but that was a very important part of, of the process. Um, we are heavy on insert, lighter on read, so of course our benchmark did the same thing. Uh, mostly we watched what happened when we were writing the data, and this is important for SSDs. SSDs have a lot of variability uh, in data writes, and it depends how random or how sequential the writes are, and it has to do with how SSDs have to pre-clear a large block of memory and then write into it. And if you're doing scattered I.O., it has to sort of read the old data, clear a block, and write the new data and some of the old to fill it in. So usually sequential I.O. is, is much more um, performant on SSDs than random I.O. That's a little bit not intuitive. So for reads, you know, random I.O. is just as fast as sequential, but for writes, uh, sequential I.O. actually does make a difference. <clears throat> um, the next thing you have to do is test for durability. Uh, so is there anybody in the audience that was not aware that SSDs have limits in terms of how much you can write to them? Anybody not aware of that? <laughs> uh, well, you guys are all smart. That's good. Um, I think each cell in the 320s can be rewritten to a thousand times, and then that's it. That thing is done. Um, and so these uh, drives do have a lifespan um, after which uh, they're not going to work. And the way the drive vendors mitigate some of that is by having extra space on hand um, and they use load balancing techniques to sort of even spread out the right load across the disks. And uh, some of the newer drives have much more uh, sophisticated algorithms and buffered memory, extra memory over what you get uh, for what you can allocate for the logical size. Um, we had to test for this because we used a 320 drive for our first round um, and you know they have relatively limited durability. Um, nevertheless, we actually uh, found out that we were in okay shape as far as durability went, but it's definitely something uh, that you have to look at. Um, next thing is different schema configurations. Um, we have one schema we use for time slice data on the hard drives and we discovered we could move to a simpler schema uh, for the SSDs that was easier on in insert uh, and still relatively performant on the read side. Um, and you may have a similar situation with your own database schema. Uh, and in terms of database config, there's already a lot out there. Percona blog has some good helpful advice on um, configuration tuning for SSDs. Uh, and you can put that in the mix as well. Now if you do all this and the results are not compelling, um, try different drives. So if you're finding out that you're still, you know, more bottlenecked on I/O than you thought, um, there's faster and fancier disks than the Intel 320. What we found at the end of our testing um, was that we took the I/O utilization in our benchmark from 50% uh, down to 15. And so, I mean, we could go lower than 15, but at 15% utilization on the disk, um, that's pretty darn low. And so the, uh, the Intel 320 was our starting um, disk, and it was turned out to be uh, the ending disk that we chose for this. Um, here's an example of the benchmark data that we got. Um, and so I've circled in red kind of the, the critical data down at the bottom. Um, but what's interesting is most of the data at the top is related to how much time the test took to run, CPU during the test, and even disk I.O. utilization, um, those numbers are comparable between the hard drives and the SSDs. Uh, and so in the end for us, write performance was not a whole lot better. It was about the same. But what's a lot better is the read performance. The query time is, is 5x improved. Um, and this is a very simple benchmark test. Of course, SSDs really start to shine when there's heavy concurrent load on the system, which during our peak hours we were getting, they tend not to degrade as much in performance uh, as the hard drives do. That's one of the big selling points. But right out of the gate, read performance, five times better, um, and write performance is more or less comparable. Um, then we modified our database schema, as I mentioned, and things got even more interesting. We uh, took the test time uh, down substantially. Uh, we took disk utilization down from I think it was actually 40% down to 17 uh, in the previous test. Um, and query time is still 
reasonably good, 0.6 seconds. So it's slower than the previous schema. Um, the previous schema was heavier on insert, better on read, uh, and we decided um, to go with a schema which is still pretty good on read and is much lighter weight on insert. Um, so SSD has allowed us to evolve uh, and we still have more um, to do there. Um, so a little bit more about drive durability. Um, one thing to remember, of course, is that when you have a, a RAID array set, um, you instantly get you know, n times better durability. So if you have one disk versus, or 10 disks versus one, uh, then each disk is doing one-tenth the activity. Um, you're going to get 10 times the durability out of any one disk. Um, different classes of disk have different ratings. Intel also has a 710 series that they call their enterprise class disk. Um, and that is approximately, I think, 20 or so times more durable uh, than the Intel 320 that we picked. Um, when we look at durability, of course, for us, three-year durability versus, uh, say, 60-year durability, uh, in, you know, SSDs are changing so quickly. Uh, we figure we'll be in the new SSDs in a year or two, um, certainly not, you know, longer than three or four years. Um, the nice thing about these drives is you can measure durability. Uh, you can make um, smart control ca calls out. Uh, and you can um, get the durability data. You have to start a timer, run a test, stop a timer, and then query the drives. And they tell you how much uh, lifespan was just used up during that test. And then you can project out um, from there. So we decided, uh, after doing all this analysis and talking to Intel and looking at the numbers, uh, to take that plunge. Um, we bought 150 of the 320s. Uh, we bought uh, 12 cages to put them in. We have one cage available as a hot spare uh, in case uh, we have a problem. And as soon as we started to put these into production, uh, install them, we realized that SSDs are not yet mainstream. Um, first of all, you know, anybody that's worked with a Dell equipment, Dell is very picky about the drives they recognize. <laughs> we knew this going in, of course. Um, we decided to be cavalier and say, screw it. Um, and when you decide to be cavalier and say, screw it, you know, at least don't have to pay Dell for their support, because they won't support you with these disks. So, you know, it cuts the bill in half, at least, which is nice. Um, but, you know, even though the 320s have been around for a while, and Dell equipment's very standard, you know, we had several um, issues uh, related to that. So, um, you know, some disks weren't recognized when we kind of put them in and we had to recycle the cage and pull the disks out and put them back in. And um, we had problems early on with the automatic array rebuilding. It's part of the 320 or part of the, um, the Dell storage series. Uh, and um, some simple things like the drives don't blink. And that may, for those of you guys who don't do production operations, that's a big deal. If you have a bad drive, you got to blink it. You go to the console and you say, that drive's bad, blink it. And you call the data center and say, pull, the, pull, the, pull out the blinking drive. So if the drives don't blink, then it's like, okay, I'm pretty sure it's like slot seven that you want to yank. And then the guy yanks it and you're like, all right, was that the right one? Uh, or if I just screwed up, I erased that, right? And then finally, uh, you know, there is an issue which we kind of ran into is when we have these problems, who do you call? I mean, who's responsible? You call Dell, and they're going to say, well, hey, you know, you're not using a Dell-supported drive. Um, and, you know, if you want a Dell-supported SSD drive, has anybody looked at the pricing of those lately? Like five grand for 100 gig or something? That's really bad. Um, and then uh, Intel is like, well, you know, we don't know, and we don't know Dell equipment. We think we work, and we're supposed to work, and that someone made it work with Dell once. And um, so there's a little bit of uneasiness there. but. You know, for us, we were, we were committed to this. We wanted to get those SSDs in place. Um, we figured we'd probably have trouble with any of the vendors. And so, you know, let's just forge ahead, basically. Um, so we are running in production now. It's been about a month. We've got some data that we've captured. Um, this shows the difference in the I.O. utilization on the box. So again, I talked a little bit about that top graph earlier. Um, and that's what the bottom graph looks like now. So substantially lower in, uh, in both read and write. And then, of course, the main thing um, is we don't see nearly as much read spikiness. There's a little bit in there, uh, but the read spikiness is smaller duration and not nearly as uh, significant. 
um, as it used to be. So if you're looking at a systems um, perspective, this has been so far a success, right? That can't hard to argue with that. And we're seeing fewer outliers in the app. Um, this graph I'm showing is a is a standard called AppDex. Um, is there anybody that's heard of AppDex in the audience? There's a few. So <clears throat> AppDex is kind of an SLA bucketing algorithm. And it's it's most important, its advantage over average response time is that it is better at detecting outliers. And we knew going into this that we had some big customers that were having slow page requests and they were the outliers. Um, and so AppDex is a measure of like outlier success. And so <clears throat> the red line is when we deployed SSDs. And I've just drawn a, I've, I've drawn a, a black line that goes horizontally there. Um, and you can see before the red line, you know, we were at a certain AppDex level. And then afterwards we kind of bumped up um, in a noticeable way. Not in a massive way, uh, but in a noticeable way. Um, if you look at the average response time graphs, I can tell you they're not nearly as interesting. Average response time did not move hardly at all. And it turns out that it, on the, in average, um, we have a lot of small, short, fast requests to our site. And a lot of that stuff was already in memory. It was already cached in the database. Um, and so SSDs did not make much of a difference in our average response time. Uh, and that's a relatively important thing. If you're selling management, on upgrading to SSDs, you just need to set those expectations correctly about what's going to happen. You're not going to magically get a website that's 10 times faster. Um, but for larger pages, for bigger customers, for when the caches are cold and the databases don't have it in memory, you know, those are the things where SSDs are going to shine. Um, so us, for, for us, this isn't the end of the story. Obviously, for us, this is the beginning. You know, we've got more things that we um, want to do. We decided not to do all the fancy um, tuning for MySQL yet. Um, and the reason was is we wanted a relatively consistent benchmark before and after. And so now um, that we've collected my data and I've done my on a live talk, we will go ahead and start monkeying around. And um, I highly recommend uh, bringing in an expert to do this. You know, we're experts in performance monitoring systems. We're not experts in the database. And um, we use Percona, but whatever this, whatever you guys use, um, you want to bring somebody in who can, you know, make the two, make the changes, test it in your test environment, and then help you roll it out to production. Um, what we found is that the standard recommendations from the Percona blog, for example, um, only some of those helped us because of our workload. Um, so not like the, you know, don't flush adjacent adjacent pages during you know, to be um, page flushing, that didn't seem to make any difference in our case. Um, and so we worked with Percona to come up with a set of options that did seem to make uh, the most difference for us, and we found that to be um, important. And the other thing, too, is we have more we can do in our application. Now that we know we have, you know, zero latency disks, um, we can change the way our application works. We can, you know, be more aggressive in other areas, and maybe even add new data types that we couldn't add before. So um, one of the things you'll discover is when you get to production, um, it opens up new worlds. It opens up new use cases uh, for, your, uh, for your application. So it's a relatively short um, talk, but I also want to save plenty of time uh, for questions. And uh, questions for me or anybody that wants to share uh, their own experiences or, or thoughts on, uh, on moving to SSDs. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. What was your uh, original motivation to go all SSD as opposed to doing something like flash cache? <clears throat> so um, flash cache is one possible uh, solution. You put an SSD in and it kind of sits in front of your hard drive pool. There's various, I think, styles of it, right? You can, yeah, it has three modes. And, and you can even, I mean, even today you can buy, so there's, you know, you kind of plug an SSD drive in and it fronts. You can buy drives that are hybrid drives, um, some SSD and some regular hard drives. So we actually kept our hard drives. And what we now, is, now have is two tiers of storage. Our hot data is on the SSD tier, but we kept the MySQL instance running on the hard drive tier, and we migrate data as it gets older 
because usually the older data is less interesting for our customers. We're going to migrate that off to the secondary tier, uh, which conceptually is kind of like flash cache. Um, and the other thing too is, I tend not to be a fan of um, caching that's, I don't fully understand what's going to happen under like high load situations. So I'd rather have like SSD volume and a, and a hard drive volume because I'm a software guy and I can move data between them myself. And I don't know, I just, I, I like that better. But um, yeah, things like flash cache, which are easy to put in and automatic. Um, for many applications, that's all you need to do. And you'll see a pretty uh, big speed. See, Chris, do you know if we, I think we've been able to install the firmware upgrades through the... Not, not through the cages. Not through the cages. <laughs> Intel has been uh, going to get back to us for about a month and a half. I've got uh, Chris here who's on our operations team. Um, yeah, so we're kind of on the bleeding edge. Um, and uh, the, the good thing is, is we can move load around. So if we need to do service on a shard and like redo stuff, we can point load off and we can move data off uh, and then we can service a, a shard. It takes us a little time to do that, but we can do it. So we haven't completely boxed ourselves in, but the truth is, is we are, we, we went a little bit aggressive on this one and you know, they come back next year and say we were too aggressive. <laughs> we'll have to see how that goes. Um, more questions? Has anybody gone through a similar upgrade in the audience here? Kind of curious if anybody's been through it. You've been through it. I mean, I don't know. You, you mind just sort of sharing briefly your how it went for you? Yeah, it's been great so far. Uh, relatively few issues. We, we went a little bit different route. We put all the drives in general, and then we're going to have uh, three LSI controllers, and then kind of get an LVM over the top of all that. Okay, so you, you had a successful upgrade. How many disks went into your servers? I mean, just a total. Fourteen discs directly in the server. Great. Um, we replaced the HDs in some uh, Dell or some HP servers, DL creators, uh, with SSDs. And uh, HP seemed quite forgiving on which disks you put in, or put in inside SSDs, they recognize them. They seem to work pretty well. Results are. So even the choice of a vendor like HP over Dell can make a big difference. And I, mean, I think the thing about Dell is, you know, they, they like to more sell like everything Dell, kind of closed systems. And um, you know, we, we we were doing our own in, in the world of the cloud. Everybody asks, well, why we even why do we have our own hardware? And we have our own hardware because we're a little bit special with all this data that we we write. Um, but we decided to sort of make a decision to go with Dell. Once you sort of go all in with a vendor, you can get there. And, um, HP also has, you know, great products in, in, in as well. Okay, Corsair. Yep. And are those the are those three gigabit or are those six six gigabit? There's a new <clears throat> right. There's a whole new. They get. I mean, we're not we're not SSD experts, um, and so we kind of went for a mainstream device. And if if you're not SSD experts, you might just want to play it safe too. But um, there's a new generation of drives out. They've been out for about a year. Much higher speed, much higher write rates, um, higher um, interconnect, six gigabit versus three. So if you really want bleeding edge performance and that's what you need, you, know, you should definitely look at those newer drives. Uh, we haven't migrated yet, but we are looking at it right now. Um, we have sure. Um, the SSD, the Intel SSD, or the PCI, like the PCI product? Nope, these are all um, SATA. Uh, and we do, our SAS um, cages can do SAS or SATA um, in the cage itself. So these are two and a half inch disks. In fact, I popped one in my laptop 
one of the uh, refurb units they gave us is now in my MacBook Pro here. Um, but uh, they're just the two and a half inch hard drive formats that plug into, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of different styles of cages that you can hook into servers and whatnot. It's not plugged into the sub itself, right? It's not. We have an external cage. Um, 24 discs go into that, and then there's a cord that plugs into our RAID controller, which has an external jack on the server. Um, and then we just decided on that architecture because we could add more cages if we needed to. Or let's say, you know, the cage itself goes belly up. We can put a new cage in and put the disks in, or the server goes, you know, we can replace the server. We, we like that li limited flexibility and plug and play um, of devices. Yeah, Right, PCI. Yes, uh, Use an IO as a yep. PCI card. Yes. And then the other company, uh, Nimbus, Nimbus Yeah, the SAT. Right. Yeah, there's different ways to do it, and, and they've all got their, you know, they've all got their places where they make the most sense. And for us, we like the architecture of just two and a half inch disks, because I mean, maybe we're not going to be on Intel disks in a year, and we decide. You know, Seagate disks are now great and fast and big, and we're going to slot those in. So that that flexibility of using a regular disk format um, for us was kind of important. I saw a bunch of hands go up. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, oh, sorry, I'm not familiar with uh, the models. Uh, the uh, Intel disks, uh, they are they uh, MLC, and that's <clears throat> primary why the durability is low. It's a 600 gig drive, and of course they leave extra space um, to, for durability purposes. Uh, there's also a 710 series, which is a, their enterprise grade, and that's got, again, about 10 times to 20 times the durability. Um, that's still uh, MLC. They just reserve even more um, space that you can't get at, um, but that helps the durability. And they're smaller because it's as a result. Yeah. And that smallness was one of the big problems for us. We like 600 gig. That's a great size uh, for what we use. Well, you should test it. You need to test it in your own uh, right workload. That's yeah. what I recommend. Because, it, it, and then you need to measure it. Then you'll know for sure. You know, otherwise you're kind of guessing, and that's a little bit, it's a little bit risky just to guess. Yeah, we are testing fusion in production, and it's pretty good. Last year, I tested. Yeah, I think Fusion is known for the high durability. Five minutes. Five minutes? Five minutes. <laughs> I think we ran our test for 16 hours and then used the smart controller interface to, to ask the drives you know, how much wear did they get and then project that out. Um, that's how we came up with a three year lifespan for our 320s. How many different so we only benchmark one, and, and the reason was um, we started with one. We didn't know how the benchmarks were going to go. Um, we started with a very mainstream, you know, kind of well-respected Intel. You know, it's not the cheapest, not the fastest. It's not anything great, except that overall, it's like not a bad choice because it's pretty high, uh, good reputation. And after running all our benchmark tests, we said, well, you know what, this drive is good enough, and you know, we're kind of friendly with Intel, they can help us through it. Uh, and if the drive's been out for a while, it's got a good reputation. Um, and so we just went with it. Um, and you could take other approaches, you could, you know, have a bake off. We knew other drives were going to be faster. I mean, we just knew it. And, but, you know, did we really want to go with other drives? They were newer. Um, and so we, you know, not being experts in SSDs, we just decided to play it safe. And that's not a bad place to start. I'd recommend if you're nervous about getting into SSDs, just play it safe, because chances are they're still going to make a big improvement um, to your site. So anybody from Facebook, leave a ball <laughs> or kind of Facebook ball. Any other questions? Um, well, I appreciate that interactivity. I think this is good and. Um, if you have any questions afterwards, don't hesitate to uh, come ask. And uh, thanks for coming out on the last session of the um, conference. Appreciate it.